Good morning and happy Sunday. I hope everyone's weekend has been fantastic so far. I'm going to fiddle with my settings for a second here and make sure I can see you all. Great to see so many familiar names as always. I see Sue, Christina, Mishka, Kathleen, Cindy, Unix by the Creek. Um, let's see, who else do we have? I don't want to miss anybody. Deborah, good morning. Not morning where you are, I'm pretty sure. Um, great to see you all, Antoinette, as well. Oh, it is a lovely day. I'm really excited for today's show. I'm excited for all of our shows, but we are going to be talking about brooches and jade. So, brooches have long held a, a deep love in my heart. It actually started when I was a kid before brooches were what I gravitated towards or pins, it was all about pins like this. So I used to collect these little badges everywhere we went, whether it was flea markets, special events, going to the circus. My dad gave me a bunch of his old beetle pins from when he was in his youth collecting as well. And I would put them on this pin hat. It was one of the many, many collections that I had. And I have, you know, kept this one going. I'm going to put it down because it makes a lot of noise. <laughs> but one day, maybe we'll do a little bit of a deep dive on that. Hi, I'm just going to try to catch up to the chat. Hi, Donna. Hi, everyone. The thing about brooches, as we think about them, when we think about jewelry, is that um, they can be very, very hard to date. And that's because styles tended to carry over. So today, we're going to do a deep dive and talk about the construction and the anatomy of a brooch and what different tips and clues you can look for to help you date them. Now, nothing is 100% guaranteed, but there are some really great ways to distinguish things that are antique from vintage and more recent. And of course, there's always uh, great screenshots you can grab as tips for yourself as well. Good morning, Catherine. Hi, Barbara. <laughs> Yes, it really does make great wind chimes. You know, when I pulled it out this morning, I had forgotten how much noise it makes. Well, Sunday Brunch is all about research and education, so we are going to jump in. And before we do, I do want to say special thank you to all of those who have joined the Extra Scoop Club and Patreons. I really appreciate your support. It's fantastic. It helps me uh, get different tools, software, and of course, buy more goodies to share with all of you. We will also be doing a giveaway for a mug, as always, today. Um, and I'm going to give you the sneak peek. You can start typing hashtag win, all caps, right now, as soon as you like. We'll throw it in. Uh, make sure you get that entry in. I take care of the shipping and everything, no matter where you're based worldwide. So please do enter for your chance to win one of these fantastic mugs. They are large, 20 ounces. Can't go wrong with a mug of that size. Okay, let's begin. We're gonna start off by talking about the anatomy of brooches. So I'm gonna hide this and bring up a slide so that we all are on the same page when we're talking about what a catch is or a clasp or a hinge or the pin stem. Let's start right here. The anatomy of a fastener. Now I did a bit of a deep dive on this in an earlier video and you may recognize some of these slides, but I've modified them just a little bit. So the hinge is the piece that is on the far left and that is the piece that is going to be uh, bending. It is anchored to the brooch and allows it to fasten. The pin, of course, is the most obvious piece. Uh, it is the long pin in between that is going to pierce the fabric that you are adhering your fastener to. And the catch is the piece that holds that pin tip in nice and securely to make sure that you're able to wear it without any problem whatsoever. Now hinge timelines. This is one of the great ways that we can begin to date things. So we are going to take a sneak peek at a couple of timelines and we'll take a look at each of these components beginning with the hinge. Now the tube hinge is the antique hinge that we are all the most familiar with. It is the oldest hinge type and really it's two pieces that are soldered together and it looks like a tube. I will be showing you some videos of pieces in my collection so that we can get a close look. Um, this here is a great screenshot. Now the round hinge, I've put here that they were 
popularized from 1920 onward, and they were a single piece, again, that was round. But I want to be specific. These are the mechanically made, mass-produced round hinges. You do see some round hinges in handmade pieces earlier than 1920, so we'll talk about that. But as a general like rule of thumb that you can use, these tube hinges began being used as early as 1700, continue to be used, um, and they do continue to be used even past 1910, but after 1910, the round hinge became more popular. So we're next gonna pop into the pin. The longer a pin is, the older it is, is a good rule of thumb. And this is because fabrics used to be a lot thicker and it would take a very long pin in order to pierce through them. Now here's an example, and we're going to take a look at the video too, but you see how far it extends past the brooch, and especially past the catch as well. In this example, it's got a perch of bird, um, it goes way, way past the outside of the brooch, and this would allow it to be worn in some of those really thick fabrics, which really were much more common, especially in the earlier part of the 19th century. Let's keep going. When we think about the catch, there are a lot of details here. Now, it evolved in many different ways, and I've only captured four to show here. The C catch, or C type catch, is the earliest, and really it's just a loop of metal that allows you to pop the pin underneath of. Sometimes they're much more round and tucked in, sometimes they're a little bit more square, but in general, it is just one little loop. The evolution of these catches brought us to safety catches, and the idea was that people wanted something that was going to help make sure that brooches didn't fall off of their clothing. No, no matter how thick or thin the clothing garment was, they wanted to make sure that it was on and not going to be lost. So safety catches began being created. And I've listed two different types. They really started to be experimented with around the 1880s or so. Trombones have a very particular look to them and are often found on French pieces, but not just French pieces. And they really have like a trombone-like mechanism that slides out and allows you to pull it out, pop out the pin, put the pin back in and push it close. And they're quite secure. The lever safety catch was also introduced around the same point in time. And it is very similar to the round one, but the lever works in kind of the opposite direction in many cases, where when you push on the lever, it actually is going to close the catch. The modern safety catch, and this is the one that we're referring to as the prefabricated uh, mass produced catch is round and really is seen in pieces from about 1920 onward. So in terms of fasteners, if you want to grab a screenshot of this, you are welcome to. This is a little bit of a timeline that I've thrown together, layering catches, hinges, and pins. When you look at any brooch, you need to take into account all three of these components, as well as, of course, the material, as well as the workmanship, um, the style of the piece, and that can help tell you the story when you're trying to date a brooch. So if you've got a C catch and you've got a tube hinge and a really long pin, you can, you know, generally by your rule of thumb, say that you've got an older piece. Now, if you had a C catch with a round mass produced hinge, this is going to be a later piece especially if it's got a much shorter pin. And it's, uh, you know, any, everywhere in between, we're gonna show a few examples of special safety catches that were created. They don't just come in the form of a trombone or a safety catch or lever catch as we know it. So let's do a little bit of a deep dive. What we're going to do is, as always, play a dating game. But before I have you play the dating game, I think it's only fair to show you a lot more examples in actual brooches. Now, I've got some brooches next to me, such as this lovely one here, but we're going to grab the video first so that you can get in really close, because I know sometimes it's hard to see all the details. So first, I'll give you a sneak peek of the dating game that we're going to play, and then we're going to jump right in. And good morning, Lily, Kathleen, T. Marie. I'm catching up now. Linda, it's great to see you all here. Daria, Sheila. 
Delia, Jagar. Oh, happy, happy Sunday to all. All right, let's take a look at a video of several different brooches. I'm going to slow this down enough that we can talk through, and we are going to start from the oldest to the most recent. Then I'm going to have you all try to guess which of these brooches is the oldest to newest. This is going to be our quiz for today. Don't worry, I will share the slide again. Of course, I need to show you the back if we're going to be talking about how to date these fine pieces. But without further ado, let's begin looking at some specific examples so that we're able to really dive in deep. Good morning, Charlotte. Okay, so this is that gutta percha bird. You can see the details a bit better. The long, long pin. You see the hinge is indeed a tube with wire wrapping, very primitive, and a sea catch on there as well. Very crudely made, and this is as they commonly are created. This one is again gutta percha with some jet inset as well. Note it is again another long pin stem that extends well past that sea catch, and we do have a tube hinge. Again, it looks almost like a little nail with wires wrapped through, kind of a primitive way to put this together. And this was really very common when things were being made this way. It was also known as almost a form of cold solder to jam the, the findings in. You've seen this before. This is one of my favorites. I'm gonna pause it right here. This is gold, mother of pearl and pearls, all held together with horse hair. Um, and it is a very distinctive catch that we see on this. You've got your sea catch, as you would expect, your tube hinge, but it's got a half moon that is made to be sewn in using that horse hair as well. Let's take a look at that pin on it. This one is only partially extended. I'm calling it a slight extension, and this is likely to have been worn on a lighter garment by a young woman. But again, we see that same construction here. Now, this is another oldie. I'm calling this one a rustic tube hinge. The hinge is on the bottom part of the screen on the left-hand side. It is really interesting because it wraps through. It's almost like a V in order to go up through the modified C-type hinge. And then the anchor point is again, all handmade. So this is an older Scandinavian piece. Love having this one in my collection. And it's quite interesting, distinct construction. This brooch here is from around 1880. We've got a modified tube on it. The pin has slight extension, just barely past the end of the brooch. And here we have a different way of adhering that tube hinge on where it's anchored in two places, but it's not connected in the same way. This is a little bit later, closer to 1890, 1900 Art Nouveau piece. We've got here one of our early safety catches. We'll take a close look. This is all hand fabricated. And then we have that hand fabricated early round end too. And you can detect those by looking for some workmanship's marks like tooling. This is an 1885 brooch from a carnival in Montreal. And it has a really interesting mechanism. So we'll, we'll try to get in a little bit closer in just a second on this one. But this one opens and closes in two ways. There is a modified end, as you can see, that allows you to depress the pin and then just slip it underneath. It's rather interesting. Still with the tube hinge, the pin is not at all extended. This is from around 1912, and it has a similar mechanism. Again, a modified early round hinge, as you see. And again, this is the same mechanism I did not mean to restart that. I'm so sorry. That is the same mechanism as we see on this brooch here, where you simply depress it ever so slightly in order to remove the pin. When I first got this one, I actually had never seen a hinge quite the same. Um, sorry, I should say a catch quite the same. And it took me a while to figure it out because I thought I was supposed to maybe bend it upwards. No, that is not how it functions. And I'll show it to you in a moment. Here we have what I like to call spun silver, again with an early round hinge and an early trombone. Note how it's only anchored on one side. So this was the beginning of people making their own prefabricated pieces and trying to get them to work. 
this one actually I've got from Denim to Diamonds. It was the first piece I ever purchased from her. And now this one here, similar mechanism, but as you can see, the round hinge is a different fabrication. Note the special details that are on this. This is a Georgian Revival Art Deco period piece. And here is another one with an early round pin, sorry, early round hinge, a pin with no extension, and the catch is an early safety, as you can see. And we'll take you through this one as well. This one is another Art Deco piece, the hinge early round. There is no extension whatsoever. This one also hand fabricated. And note that we have an early safety. Again, it's that lever just a little bit more square when it's back like this, it's open. When you close it, it locks it into place. And finally, this is an example of one with mass produced pieces. We've got a mass produced round hinge, no extension to the pin, and a mass produced catch. And that is anchored on with some solder. And that concludes our little video to get us started so that we're able to begin to play the dating game. Good morning, Lori, Stacy. Jane, it's great to see you all. You are just in time to join us in a fun dating game, as we always like to play. So today we are going to try to put in order these brooches. We have A, B, C, and D. I will talk you through each of them and we will take a look front and back. But first I will show you a video of these. And why I think that it's really important to chat about these findings is, is to truly make sure that when you are looking at something, you're able to say with certainty, you know, is it old? Is it vintage? Is it antique? Is it more modern? So I've got a video that I'm going to play for you now, and we're going to take a look at these brooches in action, and then I'll have you put your guesses in. I want you to put in the order of, maybe just put the oldest and most recent and what falls in between. <laughs> So you may recognize some of the findings on those brooches as being very similar to the examples that we looked at. So hopefully that's going to help everyone out. I'm gonna add this up on the stream. I will show you the front and the back one more time. There we are, so that you can guess maybe the oldest and the most recent. I would do that. Or you can put them the letters in order, your choice, but we will go through each of them, talk about the details and what we know about them. Good morning, Pigeon Brother Blood Ruby. <laughs> Please do enter hashtag win all caps as well for an opportunity to win a mug. and I'll give everyone a few moments. I'll flip back and forth between front and back in case you want to catch, <laughs> no pun intended, another look. And I'll begin to talk through some of the details. We've got opals in gold in A, dragon's breath glass in sterling in B, mother of pearl, tortoise shell, and sterling in C, amethyst, tiny diamonds, sterling, and gold appliques in D. And let's take a look at the back again. And look carefully for the hinge details, the catch details, and get those guesses in. Thank you all so much for playing along. It's always lots of fun. All right, feel free to continue guessing and continue modifying your guesses as well as I continue 
to show you some details. This is brooch A. From the top, you can see that there's an extra little pin that is sticking out on the bottom. And the bottom image, which shows you the reverse, allows you to see the double pin mechanism. So there's almost a cage on the far left side that is the catch piece that is allowing the pin to kind of stay closed. And then the far end that has the hinge also has an extra little pin to almost double secure <laughs> this brooch. It is going nowhere when you wear it. It stays perfectly put. You'll note that there is a round hinge on it, um, but it looks to be handmade. And this entire piece is handmade. This is B. B has some really stunning dragon's breath glass in it. Um, and as we can see from the back, marked sterling, the pin does extend just a tiny, tiny smidge, but we've got a round hinge and we also have an early-ish catch, but these appear to begin to be part of that group that is mass produced. And here we have C. First thing that you note is definitely that elongated pin. It pops out way past the edge of the tortoise shell. When we take a look at the back, the construction is very rustic. You've got riveting that is holding it all together. Most certainly a tube hinge and you see that C catch as well. And here is D with our amethyst. Tiny little rose cut diamonds on either side, some gold accents some very detailed silver work. In it, we've got quite a fancy trombone safety catch. And then we've got a round hinge as well. So we're gonna begin to put it all together, starting by looking at the hinges. <laughs> You're gonna start to recognize the pieces and know which one we are talking about. Um, based on that scallop of detail, you probably recognize the tortoise shell as being on the earlier end. We see our nice tube hinge there. Around 1890, we've got the opal brooch. Around the 1920s or so, we've got the, let's call it the silver amethyst gold detail brooch. And then the dragon's breath glass is overlapping over the 1930s. It is early art deco. In terms of the catch, we'll take a look at them again here as well. We've got that C catch from the early part of the 1800s. This, this brooch, I can tell you a little bit more about it when we complete going through the timeline details, but it is an early piece, pre-Victorian, it is late Georgian. The opal brooch, again, sitting at that 1890, has that funny little cage kind of catch on it, which is very interesting and also very secure. You can see another one of the flower details on the trombone catch of the sterling amethyst brooch. And then you see the early safety catch, but does appear to be machine made on our dragon's breath brooch. And to look at the pins, we can also see the same detail as discussed. The first one extends quite far. <laughs> the second one, of course, is covered. That one in the cage from 1890, which is really a, a artisan's work and thought out way of creating a different type of safety, is just barely extended, but still stuck inside the cage. And then our 1930 example is just barely extended. So that takes us to our brooch timeline. Now you can see them for the front. And I should have lettered them properly here too. <laughs> Congratulations to all who got this correct. It was definitely not an easy quiz at all. Um, these pieces are some of my favorites. I think you probably saw them clearest in the photos, even clearer than I'm able to show you here, but this is quite an interesting one. And what drew me to it was the construction. Um, you don't find a lot of pieces that have mother of pearl and also tortoise shell in them. And this one's in quite good condition. So it is indeed the oldest one. Thank you, Pigeon Blood Ruby. I am a big, big fan of Dragon's Breath. And we will definitely be doing a show on that coming up pretty soon. 
This is the opal example, and it is something that was made by an artisan with a lot of care just before the turn of the 19th century. And it is sharp, sharp, sharp. So especially this little extra extender piece right here, it really loves to hook and grab onto your clothes. And these opals, the camera never does them justice. They are like fire. When you find the trombone catches, you are often going to find fun little details like that rosette that you can see. Um, and it is a sign of a nicely made piece for sure, if it's got that level of detail. We can see from the rest of the craftsmanship in this brooch as well that it is quite well made and detailed as well. And then Dragon's Breath Glass, let's see if the light's going to do it justice. Well, not too, too bad. You can see that breath. So Dragon's Breath is a very special glass. It is a lost recipe where um, they used to put molten metal into molten glass and it would create this breath-like appearance. They're almost like blue or purple breath in a pink or orange base. There's the back. So thank you for taking a look at the brooches with me. Lots of fun. I do want to talk about brooch repairs before we jump into talking about jade. So this is a top tip that I have for you. Um, thank you so much for the compliments on my collection. I really, really appreciate it. You know, it, it's taken years and I, like many of you, patiently hunt, patiently look for some really good deals. And that's where this tip is coming from. So often people think that if a brooch has been repaired, especially the back where the catch or the hinge is, then it's suddenly lost its value. And I want to share with you that it hasn't. And actually, I used to be one of the people that thought this way. But if you think about it, a brooch that's been repaired is one that has actually been really well loved and has likely been repaired to last. So my attitude now is that if the repair is done well and there's not, you know, solder, lead solder that's been like leaked all over, if it's done sympathetically and made to last, then I have no issue with it. And sometimes when you look at a piece, for example, we're going to look at a piece in my collection, this one here, this is a Georgian piece but it has a safety catch, which you would never expect. And we'll take a look at a photo to get an even closer. Many people will look at that and go, oh, that's not Georgian. No, you have to know the rest of the materials and the story. And sometimes you can truly get a good bargain based on brooch, brooches that have been repaired. And I'm gonna share some of these with you right now so that you know what to look for too. So this first one, that we talked about. It is enamel and it's en grisaille, which means that the way it's shaded is meant to be like just subtle shades of that same kind of brown gray color. Pearls on the surround. And as you see, it's got a safety catch. Now these safety catches are pretty typical of early 1900 catches that open in the middle. And I've got some very small uh, brooches, some agates and gold, and then a tiny little tourmaline and gold that opens in the exact same way. And I personally appreciate that there's a safety catch on this one because it makes sure that it's not going to fall off of any garment that's being worn. And with enamel, you do want to be a little bit careful. Next up is this Pietra Dura brooch. And again, it is too early to have the type of safety catch that is on it. So it is a repair and it's something that you can see from the side. Um, I was able to get this for a really, really wonderful price. I think it was well under $100, which is unheard of for Pichadura. So keep your eyes open. Keep your eyes open at auctions, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or uh, eBay, any of our favorite sites. Pietradura differs from micromosaics because they are larger pieces of stone. So normally the black is black agate or slate, and then there are different colors of stone that have been crafted. And what they do is they choose pieces that have like the right detailing for leaves or flower petals as well. Um, the first one that I showed you, uh, this one here, retail for Georgian brooches of this type is usually around 800 USD or so. These Right now, retail appears to be going for around $400, $500. I'll give you the retail. You can always find a better bargain. I did not pay that. <laughs> it, it is truly my pleasure to share these tips. The next one, 
You all know my affinity for Scottish jewelry. So this is a Cairngorm Citrine. It is not paste. Often you can find these pieces for a couple hundred dollars with paste, but if they have a citrine as well as the bloodstone and jasper agates, then they end up going for mm, four or five hundred dollars, or at least that's what people are asking. Pull this in. So there's, you can see the white paper that it's sitting on just behind the stone. Um, but again, this one has a repair to it and it's a safety catch. And I was able to get this one for $65, which was a steal of a deal because it is citrine as well as the other stones. So again, just keep your eyes open and you will find all sorts of treasures. This is a buckle lover's knot. Again, this is something that I am deeply <laughs> in love with. As you know, it's a motif that I really enjoy. This Victorian motif stands for um, basically eternal love, protection, security, with that garter belt as well. And so normally a brooch like this would go for maybe $150 or so retail. This one I got for, I wanna say 45, much, much better price. Um, gives you an idea. And again, there is no issue with the security on it. Um, and the most important thing to me on brooches like this is the condition of the rest of the piece. So not brooches like this often can have a lot of dents and dings in them. So you want to be careful and, and look over the piece really well and see, was it really just a simple brooch repair? And if it was, it's often worth, worth taking a gamble. And then I've got two more that I'll show you before we move on to looking at Jade. The next one is one that I was able to find at a pawn shop local to me, a pawn shop thrift shop, I should say, where they have all sorts of donations that are sent in. And this was given by a family. It's got a large onyx stone, and then we've got some seed pearls, and it is in gold. And the back was a replacement catch, and it was done really well. You can see just a little bit of solder that's kind of leaking out over the side. Now for these pieces, there is glass and it is not over hair, but this is a hair compartment, what would normally contain hair. So it is likely to be a morning brooch. Um, normally, you know, they're quite heavy. They do go for some pretty good money, but with the repair, they really did not charge me very much for this at all. I think they only charged about $200 Canadian, which is unheard of. Um, it's testing for 14 karat gold as well. So really good deal. It's a large piece. Star motifs are always very, very popular too. Um, and then the last one that I'm going to share with you is one of my favorites and has been in my collection for a very long time. I'm going to try to straighten it out before I hold it up because I just tussled it a whole lot. I'm going to read the chats. I agree, Catherine. If it's in good condition, I don't mind a repair at all. Okay, so this is an early Victorian knot brooch. It's got that lover's motif with branches. There are garnets in it. These are coral dangles. When it came to me, this dangle was completely unattached and it has a modern safety catch. We'll take a look at a photo as well so that you can see the deals, the deals, the details. <laughs> and, it, and it was a pretty good deal, but let's add this to the stream. There we go. So this lets you see, you know, the level of detail that went into it. And what I love is that we can see on the right hand side, there is not solder or damage to this piece. There is a little locket window right in the center that does contain a little bit of hair. This is likely to be an amatory piece. The garnets are all in excellent condition. They're closed back. The chains that suspend it also in really good condition too. So I was very lucky to add this to my collection. I believe I paid about $700 for it. Um, normally they go for double that if you can find them and it really is a large piece. Now, one of my tips, wearing pieces like this, if you're wearing more delicate material, I always like to take a makeup pad or a makeup remover pad and slice off the top and bottom. And I put it underneath my clothing so that it reinforces the garment um, and creates like a thicker backdrop for the pin to go through. And I find that that really helps make sure that the pin is going to sit up straight and not do a, you know, a little droopy thing. So that could be a tip that is helpful for you. <laughs> oh, my friends, a lot of these things that I found, the, the ones that I found in person, this one here was local to me. The rest, internet hunting. Take a look online. We will talk about where to look 
in another show in detail, but I really like to look for um, online pawn shops. Take a look at all cities, not just the ones near you. As long as they're willing to ship, you have a chance. And also take a look to see if you can find anything on marketplaces like Etsy, Ruby Lane. Do set your notifications on gem.app. So if you use that um, application, it's really a website. You can go there if you search for anything. And if you see something like a something that you're looking for, let's say a strand of pearls, you could write pearls and then save it and connect it to your email so it notifies you when new pieces come up. But that is the key. It is all about finding the price that fits your budget that you're looking for in the condition that you want it to be in. <clears throat> and you can always trade up as well. All right, it is time to talk about Jade. I'm just going to take a, so uh, Pigeon Blood Ruby, it is gem.app. I'm gonna type it into the chat right now. And what gem.app is, is an aggregator. So they scrape all sorts of other marketplaces like eBay, Etsy, Ruby Lane, as well as websites. They do first dibs and others, and they pull all of that data together and it works like a big search engine. So if you are looking for something and you type it into their solution, it's going to return results from all of those solutions uh, or all of those platforms. And if you click on it, you're able to go directly to the listing link on the platform. And that is what we're gonna take a look at a little bit later too. Yes, I agree, Catherine, as a Canadian, our dollar does not go very far in the US and we are certainly pinged and dinged for duties and customs when things come through. So I like to look for <laughs> a good bargain. Okay, I'm gonna catch up on the chat a little bit later. Yes, Team Marie, Thicker Felt works very well. You know, that would probably be a, a wonderful sustainability initiative would be to create some little backings that can be offered and reused because I tend to use the makeup pads a couple of times and then toss it because the cotton in them becomes a little bit worn. Okay, so let's talk about jade. <laughs> jade is a confusing topic for many, and that's because we have both nephrite and jadeite that are called jade. And this is commonly accepted, especially in North America. They are technically different materials, but they have been used by many cultures for many centuries, and it is acceptable to refer to both as jade. Today, we're gonna to dive into what jade is, the difference between jadeite and nephrite, how to maybe tell them apart, although it's not that easy if you're not testing them <laughs> with a tester, and uh, where they get their value from. So if you're looking for a piece, are there any specific features that you can look for that are gonna help you get the best value? So let's begin. As mentioned, it is used interchangeably and has for, oh, well over hundreds of years. And nephrite belongs to a specific mineral series where the magnesium and the iron content really determines the appearance of the stone. And it's tremolite, actinolite. You know, I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly. Your guess is as good as mine. Um, but the more magnesium, the more sort of white and creamy the piece is going to look. And that's where mutton fat jade, which is nephrite, comes from. Jadeite, on the other hand, belongs to a pyroxene mineral group. Um, and jadeite tends to be more translucent. Now, nephrite can indeed be translucent, but it's not to the same level where the high, high value jade, and we'll talk jadeite, we'll talk about the specific names, um, do get their value from the translucency. So here are two pieces side by side, and we're going to compare the composition of them. We have some carved jade on the left, and then we have our nephrite on the right. They do come in many, many different colors, which we'll explore. When you compare the two, the hardness is similar but jadeite is actually the harder of the two stones, which means that it's more scratch resistant. People talk about the toughness of the two though, and say that nephrite is tougher because it's more resistant to pressure, to being like ground or to have a lot of, um, you know, if, if someone was to try to smash it with a hammer, it is more resistant. <laughs> so even though jadeite scratches less, 
it will smash with a hammer more easily. Interesting fact. The surface luster is what most people refer to when they try to determine, like, is it jade? Is it nephrite? You're going to notice, though, that people say jadeite is vitreous and sometimes greasy, and nephrite is greasy, sometimes vitreous. <laughs> now, how does one know what vitreous is versus greasy? If they're both a little bit of both, it makes it a little bit tricky. Yes, indeed, Jane. Jadeite is more brittle. Now, when we think about the value of these stones, texture, color, and translucency are generally some of the most important components that are looked at. So we're going to take a bit of a deep dive. But first, let's take a look at a map of the world to see where the deposits are. There are only three jadeite mines and many more nephrite mines. So nephrite is actually more common, but not all of it is gem material. So this shows us where the jade in green deposits are and where the nephrite deposits in orange are located. And this is a map of the world where the green is nephrite and jade, but everything that I've circled in blue, that is where the jade mines are, especially today. When we talk about jadeite, I really should have typed jadeite. My bad. Um, <laughs> that is in Myanmar and also in Guatemala. So those are the two regions where the most jadeite comes from. Let's first take a look at jadeite, two beautiful examples, nice translucency and wonderful green. Again, the quality factors for all jade are color, translucency, and texture. Let's talk about color first. So these are some really beautiful examples of jadeite color. Green is the most valuable, and it does come in a variety of shades, and of course there are specific shades that do carry the most value. Lavender, second. Ice, third, which is really translucent. Black, red, yellow, white, and gray. Now, I've showcased the sort of brightest, most vibrant colors for each of these. However, of course, they come in a range of colors in between, too. So the vibrancy of the color is very important when determining the factor. And when you think about green jade in particular, the most valuable green jade sits in between the blue and the yellow spectrum. As we all know, we learned in primary school, green is made up of yellow and blue. The more blue it is, then potentially the less value it has, the more yellow it is, potentially the less value it has. But what really matters is saturation and tone, as well as translucency and the color, all put together. Here are three examples. One in my collection, which sits further on the blue side. Um, this is a yellow, white, sorry, a white gold ring uh, with a piece of jade that is a little bit blue. In the middle, is the fortune necklace. This one sold for over $9 million and it is the most desired sought after imperial shade, green jade, really beautiful. And then on the far side, we have some jade that is more on the yellow side. So again, very beautiful, but the value when it hits all the notes, translucency, the right color, it sits in the middle, it is astronomical what the cost is for pieces like that. The colors of green jade that are most sought after are as follows. Imperial, emerald, and apple. They're really vibrant green colors. Um, these pictures, both the first and the third, have come from Lang Antiques. They're pieces that they've carried and they are absolutely gorgeous. Then there's the spinach green. If you played along with my quiz, my brooch does hold jadeite jade as the leaves for uh, the flowers. And it is a very deep but still translucent green color. Moss in snow is also well known. And it is a combination of white and a little bit of green. And then the chloromelanite, <laughs> try saying that 10 times fast, generally contains some black in it and can also be very, very valuable especially the more translucent that it is. Now, when it comes to nephrite, 
as you can see, try to note the greasy versus vitreous quality, especially you can see it in the bottom right hand corner. There are three really well-known varieties. The two that have names are mutton fat and chicken bone. Uh, mutton fat tends to be sort of this white, greasy, wonderful color, as you can see in the example here. Chicken bone has more brown to it and again is quite valuable. And then I've included the most common type of green that one thinks of when one says nephrite. Right here, it is that I would call it almost like a creamed light spinach with a little bit of a modeling in it. Translucency is the next piece that matters. Now, there are some wonderful terms in the Asian culture that are used to help us distinguish the transparent to opaque varieties. So I grabbed this fantastic little screenshot. There is what they call the glass type, the icy type, the icy milk type, milk type, and bean type. And I found that to be just a really poetic way to think about how things can be from transparent to opaque. <laughs> yes, Catherine. I love it. Um, here is uh, when we think about the texture, how it is normally viewed. It's based on particle size, and that, of course, is going to also impact a little bit the translucency of it. So in this screenshot, you can see the highest quality is the finest particle size, which is going to yield the clearest translucency as well. Um, and then as the particle size gets larger, it's a little bit rougher. It can be harder to carve too. You have very fine all the way up to coarse. And so when you're looking at different carvings and pieces, you can also almost distinguish the difference of them by looking at the fineness of the carving, the quality of the jade, its translucency, its color, and its saturation. Next up, we have treatments. So there are a lot of treatments that are done on jadeite, not so much on nephrite. Wax is very, very common and considered benign. So most pieces do have some wax on them to help bring through the color and translucency. Bleach, however, is used to improve clarity, and that really damages the stone from the perspective that it weakens it. So it becomes even less uh, able to handle like stress and is more prone to fracture. Polymer is generally used to act as a filler, especially if there's bleach that's done, and often dye and polymer go hand in hand, so it's like polymer that's been dyed a color to improve the overall look. Um, there are some types that are very difficult to distinguish, but they always say, you know, take it into a gemologist to have it looked at if you ever have any concerns. And these treatments are especially popular uh, on the jade that is meant to be part of like the imperial green or apple green or vibrant translucent green categories. So if in doubt, always make sure that you're able to get a lot of information about uh, how it was graded, where it was graded, or take it into a gemologist yourself. There are some things to know about the grading because there are some scales that are used worldwide from A to D based on whether or not Jade has had a treatment. So I'm going to add this little screenshot, which came from dalani.com. Um, the A grade is generally natural texture and color with no treatments. Wax is acceptable in this category. B is texture damage in a natural color, and that's because it's been improved with bleach and then possibly polymers as well. And C, similarly, bleach and chemicals and polymers. Now they're saying is is there value to this piece? No. Disagree. <laughs> there is value to pieces like this. Are they going to be in the million dollar range? Never. Can you still have a beautiful piece that is wearable with care? Yes, you absolutely can. So this is one scale that has been used. Um, and then finally, I did want to share the simulants and pretenders with you. So there are six common pretenders or stones that are confused with jade. We have dyed green quartz as the first. As you can see, it can have this wonderful translucent quality to it um, and almost looks a little bit like a translucent nephrite. Chalcedony is often mistaken for jade too, or 
jade of both types, nephrite and jadeite. Um, and it does come in a variety of colors, as we know. So here are three examples that really do fit in well with that jade top green colors. The soapstone, generally this would be more of a gray type jade replacement. And it's very, very soft comparatively, but can be confused. Serpentine is uh, sort of a green mottled look to it. Now there are some varieties that I did not talk about where they have some very distinctive names based on the patterning in them as well. Aventurine too, as you can see, could be difficult. And then green grossular garnets, like savorites, are what is said to be the most confused with the highest grades of jade. Now, on the bright side, grossular garnets are not cheap. So it is unlikely that someone is going to try to sell you a grossular garnet as jade that is not a high value jade. It is still not anywhere near the value of jade in that category though. So you've got to be careful when you are looking. Yes, Jerry, we, we will have to take a look at your ring. You are welcome to send me an email at sundaybobbles at gmail.com. Um, also, this is probably a good time to, to remind everybody there is a new Extra Scoop Club and I think there is a join button on the screen that you can see. Um, the Extra Scoop Club is a group that meets once a month. Once a month. Wow, I'm stumbling over my words today. And what we do is we play an antiques roadshow style uh, event where I take pictures in advance or videos from everyone and I do research on it. And during the event, I will present my findings. So we'll do a deep dive on the piece, on the style, the period in which it was created, how it was made, what the materials are. And then I'll also share what a retail value could be based on comparables that I found. Um, the Extra Scoop Club also gets you access to some extra community posts. And I do try to share a little bit of what I'm up to. Um, we do poll members and make sure that the timing of our events suits as many as possible. So our first Extra Scoop Live is going to be on July 7th and it's at 5 p.m. PST, 8 p.m. Eastern. So if you can make it, if you're interested, I would love to have you. I also have a Patreon as well. It's just a Patreon slash Sunday Bobbles. Um, and I've got three different memberships. So if you're looking for a little bit of extra help in, able to, in, in order to identify things, or if you need some help enabling your own research, I am happy to help you do that. So don't hesitate to get in touch. All right. Now what we do need to do is a mug giveaway. So please type hashtag win all caps for your chance to win a Sunday Bobbles mug. 20 ounces fits a lot of liquid. Everyone is eligible to join in the fun and play. I will cover shipping to the winner and it will go directly to your home. If you're in the US, it usually ships within seven days. If you are in Canada or elsewhere, I'd say it's probably a little closer to nine days, but it's gonna get there. So please do type in hashtag win and I'm going to check and see. We've got 26 entrants so far. We'll give everyone a few minutes or moments and I'm just going to catch up on the comments. Thank you, Jagar. Yes, please do hit thumbs up. And we are going to do our mug giveaway and then move into the shop with me segment where we're going to look on gem.app for some special pieces to see if we can find any good deals to highlight for those of you that are here today. And if there's something specific you'd like me to look for, please don't hesitate to ask. I was thinking that we could potentially begin by looking at jadeite and nephrite and comparing some of the pricing, but we'll have some fun. Thank you so much, Linda. It brings me great joy. I, I love it when everyone asks questions, suggests the topics they'd like to learn more about, you know, there is an unlimited variety of topics to cover, but it's always great to know what everyone's interested in. Good morning, Jeanette. Great to see you. Okay, we're going to count down 10 to 1, and then we're going to do the giveaway. I will share my screen. Let's go to the giveaway tool now. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, I'm hitting draw. Good luck, everybody. 
And Kathleen Pickens, you are the winner. Congratulations. So you have won a fantastic mug, this mug right here, and it will be shipped to you. If you will please get in touch at sundaybobbles at gmail.com and send me your address, that would be absolutely perfect. I'm gonna hide that banner. So next up, we are going to do a little bit of virtual shopping and I'm gonna check in to see if there are any special requests for today. I don't see any requests just yet. So I suggest that we begin with Jadeite. <laughs> good morning, Crystal. All good. You will be able to watch the recording back. It will be up shortly after we end. Thank you so much for joining. It's always great to see everyone. Hi, Mia. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Wintergate. Okay, so we are going to do carved pieces. You got it, Deborah. So I'm assuming you mean carved jade. Let me know if you mean anything different, but that is what I'm going to look for. I will share my screen now. Now I was looking at some jade earlier, but I'm just gonna show you how gem.app works. So as you can see, the address is gem.app. Um, that is the website that you can use. And when you search, you can look for truly anything. So for example, we are going to look for carved jade. What you can do is you can set an alert for yourself. If you would like to get emails every time a new carved jade item is found <laughs> or whatever it is that you're searching on, and you will get emails every morning. Now, sometimes you get notified after somebody snapped it up, but I'd say 95% of the time you are able to get information, which is great. Thank you so much, Mishka. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Hi, Funky Pickle. Great to see you. Hi, Fleur. All right. So we are going to begin looking for carved jade. We'll go slowly. If there is specific things, whether it's rings, pendants, earrings, statues, anything else, let me know. I'm gonna maybe start with this one. We've got a jade ring. They say it's an antique Chinese jade ring. It's beautiful. As we know, <laughs> there are varieties, many varieties of jade, jadeite and nephrite. So for fun, I think we should click in and see if they have identified whether it's jadeite or nephrite. Mm, now they're saying it's gold plated silver, but no details on whether it's jadeite or nephrite, which is probably something that I'm gonna find myself looking for even more often now when I am doing um, online shopping for jade. Okay, let's see. So car jadeite and jade have both been carved, Deborah. And in the Asian culture, what's interesting is like they had access to both and used both for a lot of important pieces. So I wouldn't say that it's more often one than another, but there is a lot more nephrite available in general, de deposits in the earth, that is being mined. So it is more likely to come across nephrite than it is to come across jade. Let's see. I'm going to scroll and see what we can find. This looks like an old Chinese export piece with some lovely enamel. They're saying it's carved in set, lovely brooch. We will see if they have told us. They're saying a Carved antique natural green jade. Again, not specific between jadeite and nephrite. I have a feeling that many people aren't specific about that. Maybe because they, one, 
don't realize that there is a difference between the minerals and uh, the material. Two, because a lot of customers don't care. I think a lot of people are buying things based on, is it beautiful? Do I love it? Do I want to add it to my collection? And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I certainly would not kick a piece of duff right out of bed. I wouldn't kick a piece of jade out of bed. These are beautiful. Oh no, Deborah, that's terrible. Jagar, I think that there are more colors of jadeite that exist, but nephrite is more common on the market based on the research that I've done. And I, I did some research with like GIA, IGS, AGS, as well as all of my favorite sites like Lang Antique Jewelry University. Um, but it seems that the most common that you will find is nephrite. Um, you, when you find pieces, especially if you find like on the shopping channel, for example, wonderful pieces that have many, many different colors to them. If they're claiming that they are jadeite jade, they likely are, but they could be treated with some of the fillers um, or the bleach treatment in order to improve the clarity and then the filler added, which is how the prices are so low. So that's where it's always good to understand, like, has a piece been treated? Here's a nice carved necklace piece. They're saying carved rose quartz and shoe jade crystal. All right, now I'm gonna, for fun, update the search to carved jadeite to see what that returns. And this is where we're seeing more variety in terms of the colors, which is interesting. So that beautiful snow, moss and snow is that white and green. Um, it's always beautiful to look. What's interesting too, is that even like with a red color, how is one to know if it is truly orange jade or carnelian without testing? It looks absolutely stunning. <laughs> the price says jade, but one would not know unless they get it into their hands. And of course, you know, agate being a common pretender, it can be very difficult to tell. Yes, there absolutely are. So Jagar, in the 1980s, this is something that I read um, in the GIA's article. That's when some new techniques came about in order to make, su make sure that it was harder to find treatments had been applied to pieces. And um, with the ways that they're now like, penetrating with the bleach and with the dye, it has become a lot harder. And apparently, especially with lavender jade, there are different techniques that are almost imperceptible. Um, so it's very difficult to detect if something's been treated or not. Sure, we can definitely look for mutton fat or the chicken bone jade. This is where it's really tricky because as we look through these fantastic listings, there's some beautiful pieces. They call this light lavender, whereas on my screen, it's showing up as quite white. Would love to know what you're all seeing. And if it was white, then one would have to question, okay, is it white jade or is it nephrite jade? And is it mutton fat? So there's, a whole world to educate oneself on in jade. And I personally am just scratching the surface with popular request. I have a couple of pieces in my collection, the brooch that I'm wearing and the ring, and I've had a few pieces pass through my hands, but not enough to by any means say that I'm an expert. I am still learning like all of you. Do we want, we want to see the, okay, let's, let's look for the most expensive pieces that we can. That's not going to cut it with a filter. Let's type Imperial Jade and see what we can come across today. Well, we're starting to see some of the more expensive ones, like this ring for $116,000. This one is at Lang Antiques. 
they are saying it's an Imperial Burma Jade Ring, which is one of the two areas where Imperial Jade is indeed mined. And take a look at the glow. And this is what all um, experts say is that when you have a piece of Imperial Jade, the glow is truly second to none. And it just stands out almost like it has a light and life of its own. That's a beautiful ring, Lang Antiques, again, wonderful source uh, for very high-end jewelry based in San Francisco. Um, they also have this necklace, which they're saying is an imperial natural Burmese jade bead necklace. And you'll notice that they're emphasizing the word natural to make sure that it differentiates them from all of those with treatments out there. So that is an expensive necklace. <laughs> and I bet you it probably looks amazing in person and feels even more amazing to wear. Jade beads just are, are so cold and wonderful. Whereas when we look at this one here, they're saying it's an imperial gold-filled jade necklace. I would beg to disagree. That is definitely not imperial. Um, and we have no way of knowing what type of jade this is, whether it's jadeite or nephrite. It's in a fountain pen box. <laughs> Um, but it does have that nephrite look to it. So this is a look that I typically would say looks like nephrite. In British Columbia, which is where I'm from, there are a lot of uh, nephrite deposits. And fun story here, I'm going to come back and tell you a fun story in person for a second. Fun story, there is a um, YouTuber who puts together some really great videos on doing gold mining and panning for gold. And he and his family also have a um, claim to a land that has jade on it. It's nephrite. And I will tell you that for the last two years, I every time he says, I'm going to get some jade, my blood boils a little. I'm like, but it's nephrite. It's nephrite. Turns out that he is perfectly right and within his rights to call it jade. I just wish that it was more specifically pointed out as being nephrite, but it, it is. And he's got some really beautiful colors. So like that last piece that I showed you, that is pretty typical. Um, and then you can find like vibrant, vibrant greens. You can find blacks. In general, they say that black is less valuable and that you are still looking for like the green and a little bit of translucency to it as well. So fun story. I'm going to catch up on these comments and see if I've missed anything. We do need to look for mutton fat and chicken bone jade. All right. What about red jade? Okay, we'll look for red jade too. Let's do it. I am heading back here. I'm going to type red jadeite. Based on the research that I was finding, um, I didn't find any nephrite jade that was red. So I'm going to type red jade see what we come across. This is not jade at all. I'm going to click on this just for fun. Um, yeah, this is carnelian with jade, which makes sense, especially for that price. Again, I would question if this is truly jade. It's beautiful. Let's go to this eBay listing and take a look at it together. So it is uh, an eBay auction from Envy Everything. And it is a necklace. Let's see how much information they give us. Unmarked measures 15 inches uh, up to 15 inches up to 5 eighths width. Condition is good, no wear. Yeah, they don't give us any details on how this was tested or anything else too. So I'm going to suggest we keep looking. I just, you know, the way I shop is quite conservative. I would love to hear in the comments if you do the same, where if you're not 100% sure, if there's not enough detail, if I was very interested in a piece, I would definitely reach out to a seller and ask for more information. Um, but red jade is is not altogether common. And so to see it for very inexpensive prices always surprises me and makes me question, like, is there is there something more to this that I'm missing? 
So let's go here. They have nine of these in stock. There's some sort of sheen that doesn't look quite right on this. Unworn, vintage Karis, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I would keep searching. Bye, Christina. Thank you for coming. Yes, always ask, always ask the seller for questions that you are not sure about. Ask for videos. Most sellers are more than happy to help out. So here is an example of what you commonly see is like the multicolor jade bracelets or other pieces that can be found. So I'm going to go to their Etsy and we are going to read this listing. So they say stamps made in China, 925. Each piece is tested by their GIA certified gemologist. Again, they've, they've only put jade as the gemstone, but I suspect they mean jadeite jade. However, because they have an in-house GIA graduate gemologist, I would definitely contact them with any questions as they invite you to do too. So if you are interested in this piece, Estate Treasures 1029, I'm sure would be happy to hear from you. It's not a bad price for $89 Canadian if it's jade and it has two lovely cabs of lavender, two lovely cabs of green, two yellow and a red. Excellent estate condition. I think you, I see, Lisa, you say that it says refinished. I'm going to keep going and share this tab instead. Okay, let's take a look at this pendant. So they have said this one is jadeite jade with a fair bit of translucency and a light milky red with a deeper red veins that are running through. on sale for $200 for a pennant still. Ah, thank you. Got it. Refinished as needed. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of places when they get pieces um, in, if they're dealing with estate pieces, they are happy to refinish them in order to maximize the value that they're able to get. And I personally am always happy when a piece has been properly cared for and, you know, gotten ready. Um, I don't love it when people polish antique silver before sending it to me. <laughs> I prefer to leave that up to, up to my discretion or up to the buyer's discretion. I do the same thing if I'm shipping anything out to anyone. But I do appreciate it if it's been looked over, if you know any prongs for stones that need to be retipped are. It's always a good thing because I like to get things in ready to wear condition unless I know otherwise. So they say Burmese natural gorgeous red jade. And if it's Burmese, they're suggesting that it is indeed jadeite jade. I am going to look at red for just a little bit longer, and then we are going to look for the mutton fat nephrite and chicken bone nephrite. Yes, Lisa, exactly. Before buying, I would also definitely ask, what do they mean? So they are saying uh, old oval jade charm. I, I don't know if we're gonna get a lot of details out of this. I'm gonna keep going. I'm gonna click on this one because it's beautiful. They're saying it's a vintage 1970s red jade dragon medallion pendant. Let's click on this listing. 
I did a little bit of a double blink for the price of 37.20. Seems extremely economical, uh, which makes me wonder, is it truly jade or is it perhaps carnelian? Whatever it is, it does have nice translucency. It is pretty. Let's read the description. There is not much of a description. Okay. Gold plated red jade pendant. That's all it says. And here, brass bronze gold. Aha. So this is not jade. The gemstone is carnelian. I knew that there was something up with this. Again, always worth reading the details. We are going to head back. And now we are going to look for mutton fat. F right. See what we find. Now this is one of the most valuable forms of nephrite as well. Um, so it makes sense that we're seeing some pretty high price tags like this $3,700 pendant. Beautifully carved. Yes, Lisa. A, B, C, and D, where A is no treatments other than wax. B generally can be some bleaching, possibly some fillers. C is bleaching and fillers. Um, basically, A is the most desired and where jade is the most valuable. As it goes down, it becomes less valuable. Okay, here's another example. What I can do is I will grab some screenshots of some of the guides that I have um, and I'll share them in the community tab. I'll put a link there. Or if there's anything anyone needs, don't hesitate to email me as well. This is beautiful carving. You've got some carved nephrite mutton fat jade plaque in the middle, and then a lot of detailed work, butterflies, enamel, looks like some coral too. Gorgeous piece. Now, this is the type of thing that my eye is always drawn to. I love the detailed carving, especially when there's like the hollows and it goes deep inside of piece. It's just beautiful. They say this is a sculpture. Um, quite nice. Small sculpture. I think like many of you, jewelry is our wearable art. So I think it's why we gravitate towards it. Yes deeply perforated. This is quite an expensive piece as well at $116,000. Might as well just call it 117 at this point. Canadian, so hey, my US friends, if you're in the market, take 30% off. Front and back is carved. It's an amulet. They say it's from the 17th or 18th century, which I'm guessing they are able to tell by, you know, designs, carving, but I, for one, would not know. It would need a lot more detail. So the sale price in US dollars is just 44000 for this piece, if you're in the market. Um, and I'm curious to see what it says here. So let's go up. Here you have it. It is with the genuine article on Ruby Lane. They say it is a superb 17th to 18th century Chinese Qing Dynasty untreated natural white nephrite jade depicting a goddess, uh, Guin Yin, which I may have said incorrectly, so please do correct me if you are able to properly tell me how it's said. Aha. Well, 
this seller at least has quite a lot of information about info about fake jade and dating jade, which I'm happy to see that they're willing to offer, especially if they're asking for a price like this. So the genuine article on Ruby Lane, if you want to go read some more about Jade, um, that was a great place to go check out. It looks like they care very much about what they do and they want to educate their buyers and others too. And, you know, have mentioned who they're certified members of. So for me, if I'm buying something, <laughs> I'm not in the market for a $44,000 item, that is for sure. But if I was buying something, even at $1,000 or above, I like to know who I'm dealing with, how they are certified, how they get their information, how they had the item tested and evaluated. Um, so I do appreciate seeing that kind of information on a site too. I am going to catch up on chat and see if I've missed anything. Otherwise, we will look for some chicken bone jade. Okay, let's do it. We will look for chicken bone jade. As soon as I share my screen. We will go back to gem.app. Only one item is being returned, so we'll change up our search in just a moment. Um, the chicken bone nephrite jade that I was finding was more opaque than this. So I'm going to flip through these colors. They say that some of the unnatural red colors end up coming out brown when people try to treat jade to make it a certain color. These photos have nothing to do with this. Okay. So I'm going to resume the search. Let's remove nephrite and see what chicken bone returns. Could be anything. It includes wishbones. It does not look like we're going to find much in terms of chicken bone jade today. Although this is quite a unique necklace if anyone's looking for chicken bone glass beads. <laughs> Okay, keep those requests coming. Was there anything else that you'd like me to do some virtual shopping for? Happy to take a look while we're together. Otherwise, I hope everyone's having a fantastic end of June, if you can believe it. Time is certainly flying. I uh, attempted to go for a walk yesterday with my husband, and I made it about two blocks out of the house and tripped like I did six months ago and managed to do a real number on my knee, my elbow, my hands. I am too clumsy. And the dogs in the park are barking. All right. Sure, chicken bone jade, I will do exactly that. Allow me to share my screen again and we will do chicken bone jade. Now this looks more like what I was seeing in the guides, but this also looks like many other rocks <laughs> that one can find upon the beach. Yes, I, my, my husband thinks that I now need to not leave the house without a helmet and some knee pads, which isn't great. <laughs> oh. Thank you, Jaycar. Okay, well, we should take a look at this listing since there are not very many of them. Might as well. They are saying it's a natural chicken bone, jade pendant, California beach pebble, sterling silver rivet. Found off the Humboldt Coast natural chicken bone jade. Again, I would be very curious to know if they, uh, how, how they came to the conclusion that it's chicken bone jade. It is nephrite, it is in the area, so it is very possible that it is. But there doesn't seem to be too much available, which is a bit of a shame. So 
anything else that we should be looking? You know, Deborah, it's so funny that you said thinking too much when you walk is dangerous. My husband asked me what I tripped over and I said a thought. <laughs> because truly I was just thinking. I was thinking about how I had to cross the road quickly. The light was changing. The countdown was on. Needed to get to the grocery store. Ah, good times. All right. Well, if there are no further requests for us to look up things today, please do consider joining the Extra Scoop Club if you have not yet. If you have questions about it, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Otherwise, I'm going to be preparing for our first event on July 7th and our next Sunday brunch, which is July 9th. Um, gutta Percha, sure, happy to look for some Gutta Percha. Let's do it. I am going to switch back to sharing this tab. My Sunday mornings are for us to spend together, so I'm happy to look. Got a Persia. Ooh, there are some beauties. If there's anything in particular you're looking for, whether it's like a, a brooch, pendant, etc. So this one is on Etsy. I'm going to jump right in. Let's go to their listing. Oh, thank you, Donna. They're saying that it is a unique gutta percha Victorian morning brooch. There's just two photos. Let's take a look at the back. Oh my, <laughs> it could use a little bit of cleaning, but we can see the tube hinge and it appears to be a C catch from what I can make out. Um, <laughs> the flowers on this, I'm sure they have meaning, but meaning. However, this does very much look appropriate as it should. It's a little black. Um, and you do want them to be black. So as they oxidize with air, they do tend to turn browner. Now, things that don't oxidize are things like glass. And as you see, the center of this looks like a very shiny black, almost glass-like sheen, which reminds me very much of this brooch, which I shared today. So that's where I, I'm questioning, is that truly entirely made of gutta percha or maybe not? Um, it could be another material, material gutta percha, vulcanite. Um, some of these things, like even bog oak, can be confused between each other. So I will definitely do a deep dive on all of those um, because there are different ways that you can test them and there's different cues you can look for visually, but it's fascinating to know how the early plastics were made, how they differ from like the actual stone or wood too. So let's go back and continue looking for some gutta percha pieces. I'm going to go back here. This looks like gutta percha to me. So this normally when it oxidized and it has a little bit of a brown to it, this is what I would expect to see. Now, 165 Canadian is not terrible, but it is a little bit on the higher side for what I've seen some of these go for lately at auction. Let's take a look at the video and see how this looks. I'm just flipping over. Here we are. So the pendant they say is 1.375 inches by 1.85, sorry, 875 inches. Nice and smooth on the back. You don't always see them in that great condition and the carving still looks really nice on this one too. So that goes, you know, a long way, which is probably in part why they're asking a little bit of a premium on it. And they have put the details. So for those of you who don't know what gutta percha is, it is indeed derived from latex from trees. Um, there are a variety of different ways these early plastics were made. Some even included things like egg whites. So it's really fascinating. So I would still say it's old. Um, some of these pieces are still in amazing condition, despite being very, very old. It's possible this one hasn't been worn a lot, and often these were worn on a black ribbon. So it could very well be that it was worn on a ribbon, and this is a new addition, I would say. And I would personally put it back on a ribbon. Let's take a look at this one. 
This one's they're saying is a bog oak frame with gutta percha floral element. Large rose leaves. And then again, you've got that early tube hinge and sea catch. And again, that kind of riveting style of construction that's put it together too. It's a beautiful piece. We've got some buckles that are on the deer side. Let's click into this. This is an antique locket from Black Crepe on Etsy. Now, it may be a locket, but it does not appear to have a bail. So I would say that it is more of like a keepsake dish than anything else. Otherwise, how would one wear it? But this is not a terrible price for this. And if you take a look at the carving, it's quite detailed. I'm going to head over to their Etsy so we can get in close together. Let's do it. Okay. So it looks like there's some forget-me-nots and then a variety of other flowers that may very well have to do with mourning. I think it may be upside down, actually, in this view because it would be unusual to have the leaves shaped like this and stem down. Let's keep looking at the pictures. Often with pieces like this, they are carved on the inside too. And this one still has a bit of a frame so that it could hold down um, glass or you know, a, a, another compartment if you wanted to put hair in there. Beautiful. I'm going to go back. Yeah, so that one I would say was probably around 1880 or so. Um, with mourning pieces, what's really interesting is that, you know, the, there was first what people often confuse with mourning jewelry as like the memento mori, which is remember you will die, um, which is really pre-Georgian period, Georgian period. The mourning jewelry then came into fashion like during the Georgian period and then through the Victorian period as well. And in the Victorian period, that's where you see a lot of these large, dark black pieces. So whether it's glass or gutta percha or vulcanite or bog oak, but any of these pieces that we're looking at right now, again, this would be like Victorian period. Um, especially during the period after Victoria lost her husband, when the whole nation was in mourning, the whole world followed suit in fashion. And so a lot of these, these pieces were created then. Um, so what we're looking at, like even this one here, again, I would say is also around that same time period. So I would say like 1870, 1880s, right around there. So Victorian, sorry, let me try that again. Mourning pieces and pieces with vulcanite and gutta percha really weren't made too far into the 20th century. Um, there was still some demand for the black pieces. Many people enjoyed still wearing some of the glass pieces up until I would say the maybe the 1920s or so, but tastes really began to change, especially towards the turn of the century, like 1900, everyone was tired of being in mourning all the time. So there was a little bit of a backlash. And that's what the Art Nouveau um, movement really had a lot to do with, like bring back color, bring back nature, bring back a little bit of softness. Here's another beautiful cameo. If there's a particular piece that you're intrigued about, I would be happy to look at a link. Don't hesitate to send it over to me. Here's another one with some beautiful carving on the inside. Now this one again has kind of like a screwed in bale, <clears throat> which makes me wonder if that last one may have been missing a component that we looked at, but look how high up <laughs> the applied detail is. Many of these pieces did not last in, in good condition. So it's nice to see it when they did. This looks like a nice little selection of jewelry, which does include some gutta percha and I think some glass as well. I'm betting it's gonna be an auction. Let's take a look. 
It is indeed. So this is an auction, Nelly's Stuff on eBay. Um, and there are a few pieces. Starting bid is $99. Let's see if we can get in close. So it looks like we have a little bit of a trefoil design, which is very popular in these pieces um, because it had to do with the Holy Trinity. So again, it was kind of a nod to the religious. I'm going to try to make this a little bit bigger for us all. There we go, so that we can see. I'm hoping this works for you too. Yes, I can see it getting bigger. Um, then we have a bar brooch with some pearls in it. There's a horseshoe, which is interesting. And then let's look at the next ones. We've got um, what is kind of a typical design where you have, it's a bar brooch and it is meant to be worn during mourning, but it's not necessarily a mourning brooch. So really it's more of a black piece. Um, whereas this floral got a percha one that is carved is more typical of like a, a mourning piece and it is meant to have meaning based on the flower. And let's see if they show us the backs. No, they do not show the backs on any of these pieces, which is a little bit unfortunate. Okay, so again, let me close out of this. So this is Nellie's stuff. If you are potentially interested in going to bid, I want to see if they have any more information. No, there are th two bar pins, one gutta percha pin, and two jet pins. They have not specified if it's French jet, meaning glass, or jet jet, meaning like essentially coal. <laughs> we would leave that to the buyer to figure out when they get it home. All right, let's continue looking. I always love these hand motifs. They're just quite elegant and they're also meant to be friendship. Let's take a look. Now, there are some different colors in brown in here, which is really interesting. You can see a lot of the like hand finishing and carving. You can see the hand finishing in terms of how the brooch was created. Um, again, an old tube here, but missing its pin. The Greek key design was always very, very popular to do with like a never ending life. And it looks quite beautiful. It's part of that kind of Etruscan revival movement, which is nice to see. This one kind of has a funny finish to it. So it almost looks like somebody may have painted over the brown because there's little bits of model black that don't look quite right. Here's the back. Again, the correct findings are there. And these sort of necklaces were also very popular during the period. Amazing work. They would carve them. Um, and sometimes you're going to find like a little slit, right? Like you can see right here where that carving allows for like the interlocking of, of these pieces. And they do go for very, very good money. You may be able to find some local to you if you're out antique hunting for best pricing. That's generally where I find the best pricing on a lot of these things. This is a beautiful one. Again, we see a nice long pin, that tube hinge with that little wrapped piece of wire, as well as the sea catch. Definitely what you want to see. I'm still looking to see if we can find a good bargain. This one's quite intricate. Yes, Barbara, I think the previous one was the lot that had a mix of them. So this one, again, an example of one that has had some repair. And I think that's part of why the price is just a little bit better. 
Um, 131 Canadian is probably right around $100 USD, which is pretty much what I see these things go for at auction. It's a nice big one, but the, the backing is not what I'm expecting. So let's go to the listing because it looks almost red to me. And see what they have to say. Okay, Victorian got a perch and morning brooch with flower design using two layers. Base layer seems to be another material. About two by one and a half inches in one and one half inches. Uh, they say excellent condition. This is from J and J as in J A Enterprise, um, and it almost with that like brownish color looks like it could be tortoise shell potentially, but it's very thick. Again, we've got that kind of riveted construction. And this is an example of what I would say is still an antique round hinge. Um, it is not your typical machine made one, which is interesting. Beautiful. All right, let's continue. Here is a three inch Victorian era got a Percha and Jet cameo. Let's take a look at this one. So 100 Canadian dollars is probably about less than 75 USD. Um, they are saying that the pennant is in good condition. Composition is got a Percha molded jet cameo. I think that they're using the words jet interchangeably with got a Percha because one does not mold jet, it would be carved. Now, the thing about these pieces too, if you've never had a chance to handle them is that because they are made essentially with a combination of organic materials um, and, and different processes, they do wear and age and oxidize over time. So they can get a little like fuzzy or the condition gets a little bit degraded. And I would say that this is an example where the sides are like shiny and smooth and maybe that's why they're calling it jet. Perhaps it's inset in something, but that's unusual to see with this type of wear too, unless it's just dirty and needs a little bit of a clean. Yeah, this one, it is a beauty. All right, let's continue with our shopping. Here's a nice in memory of design on eBay. And this one appears to be in a really nice, clean condition. IMO, you often see carved in um, the gutta percha pieces or volcanic pieces, or even you'll see it in locket where you have like the three letters IMO kind of overlaid on each other, which was a very popular sentiment. Here, it looks like this is a more modern repair because that is absolutely a machine made, both hinge and catch. Purple puffer on eBay for this one. I'm gonna close this tab. Oop, and I'm gonna have to reopen a new tab, but I'm gonna pop into comments. <laughs> Cindy, I, I know that feeling. He, he tells me what's gonna happen when I get older, am I gonna I keep hurting myself. I really hope not. <laughs> All right. Now I can continue to look for gutta percha pieces or morning pieces, or is there anything else anyone would like me to look for? As I close some of my tabs, because I'm, I've got about 30 open right now. I'm happy to take your requests. 
and I say we go for 15 more minutes and then we will call it a Sunday. Coral, you got it, Charlotte. Is there anything specific you're looking for or just coral in general? Because I will get started and Dragon's Breath Glass. Okay, you got it. We will do those two things. I'll start by sharing my screen again. And we will look for coral. And I'm just gonna start wide open with coral. This is actually a very beautiful branch coral necklace right here. It caught my eye right away. Oh, thank you, Mishka. <laughs> it is always a joy to do this. Okay, we are gonna scroll along. If there's anything specific we wanna stop for, just shout it out in the chat. And I am gonna click on a couple of things. They're saying salmon red 1960s coral necklace here, again, with tiny little branch pieces. There's something about those branch pieces. They've really grown on me. Oh, lovely. I like the color of this one. That they are calling it salmon pink. I would definitely agree. Nice carved pieces. Um, the coral does come in so many different colors. In terms of value, there's debate over is it the brightest orange Mediterranean non-dyed that is most valuable or is it more of like the angel skin kind of pale beautiful color. Um, this appears to be the angel skin variety and that actually is not a terrible price. But uh, at auction, especially on YouTube auctions, we can often find an even better deal. And I always have adored these carved pieces. The Victorians loved their coral and even like during the Georgian period, it was thought to ward off evil spirits. So often they would like give it to their children put necklaces on them. You can see all sorts of even beautiful paintings where you see like the details, the coral details of jewelry being worn by adults and children alike. This is a very pretty little Victorian geometric coral piece. I'm just taking a look at the findings here. It is what we would hope to see to kind of pull it all back together. And this looks to be a carved melon bead style or shoe in some case necklace. Really beautiful. Yes, Charlotte, there are many special names for the different like varieties of coral that can be found. So beautiful. And the angel skin is meant to look almost like a baby skin. Like it is very pale, peachy. Here's an example of Victorian brooch. And again, this one's kind of that Etruscan revival style with the details. It looks like a very nice piece of Mediterranean coral. And the construction is exactly as one would hope to see on this. So we've got our two hinge sea catch. We also have riveting um, in place, which was fairly common to see as to how the jewelry construction was done at that time. Cindy, thank you. That is a fantastic recommendation. The book Signal and Wire about gutta percha and how it was discovered and used. And still used for dentistry. That I didn't know. That is fascinating. Fantastic, Jane. I'm sure it's a very, very beautiful piece. Okay. I, I must have, you know, caviar taste today because I keep clicking into things like this. Victorian coral shooting star brooch. There was an obsession with Haley's Comet um, and every time it came around, Georgian period, Victorian period, everyone started to gravitate towards these celestial motifs again. And there's something about them. Let's take a look at the back. Yeah, see this most likely would have worn, been worn on the side just like this. 
not straight up and down as they're holding it. Um, and so you can see, again, it's got the findings that you want. Tube hinge, see catch, looks to be original, not altered. But this is meant to be worn so that this star is shooting across to the side, like when it's lying in her hand here. I'm assuming her, don't know. This person's hand. <laughs> ah, Jean, it's for sale. Perhaps I can feature it for you <laughs> next Sunday brunch. Lovely ring with a nice colored coral item. This one's more of an art deco period. Coral carved with lavalier. And of course there's amazing like stamp style native work, shadow box work that includes coral too. Okay, I am going to segue into Dragon's Breath pretty quickly here. As I scroll, keep scrolling. So this is an interesting little set on eBay. This will, this will be our last coral piece that we look at in the short term. It is um, three, it looks like three pairs of earrings that are available in a lot from Cat41211. And that is cat with a K. Starting bid is $97. Um, let's take a look at front and back. They're calling them all angel skin coral. To me, angel skin is more of um, the two smaller pieces. This brighter piece, I mean, some do consider that angel skin coral, but it's pinkier. So like it's almost like angel cheek <laughs> to me. But it all, it all, if you look up angel skin and go to like Lang Antiques, they will have categories all of these is angel skin as well um here are the findings in the back so it looks like they're just you know some randomized findings that are put on them likely the flower is probably vintage maybe the ball but not antique but a nice little set from three pairs basically making them 30 canadian dollars each which would be roughly what like 24 canadian dollars each something like that so if anyone's in the market, I agree, Kim. It does look more like that. Um, Cat41211 would be the place to check out on eBay. And I am going to go back to gem.app and we're going to look up Dragon's Breath. I'm going to start by typing Dragon Breath glass and not Dragon's Breath, and we'll see what that returns. Okay, we've got a few things. If there's anything in particular you're looking for, let me know. I'm, I'm going to point out a few things that are not Dragon's Breath glass right away here. So this, for example, is not Dragon's Breath. It is foiled glass. This is also not Dragon's Breath. So Dragon's Breath should be translucent and you can look through it. And really it's when you hold it on the bias, you see the breath. Um, or when like light hits it in different ways. And typically it is not foiled. It doesn't normally have inclusions in it. There are some art glass pieces that incorporate dragon's breath glass that will have, you know, something special or extra to them. But typically like this would just be considered art glass. This is not dragon's breath. So don't be fooled. Um, let's take a look at this for $78. This does indeed appear to be Dragon's Breath glass, marked for sterling, size 5.75. This is actually a pretty gosh darn good price. The setting is clearly vintage. <laughs> um, the cab doesn't appear to be too abraded and it looks like it's got some good breath to it. So this could be a good buy if your finger is 5.75 in size. The eBay seller is Little Valhalla. And I'm gonna scroll down to see if they tell us anything more. Vintage estate, sterling silver ring, two centimeters, dragon's breath, jelly glass, opal. Not the same thing, <laughs> size 5.75, but that is really what dragon's breath glass was meant to sort of emulate. Um, many do still refer to it as jelly glass opal or jelly opal made of glass. Let's continue looking. 
Yes, Hubble glass is fascinating. I just learned this term probably in the last year and a half from Kirsten Red. Um, and basically, for those who are not familiar with it, it is glass that is made to emulate turquoise. Um, and, and there's a whole backstory to who was creating it. And it's been kind of attributed to Hubble because Hubble was said to carry these pieces, but there's no real proof that they actually did too. So the name might be a misnomer as well, which is really fascinating. Here is a dragon's breath glass bracelet. This one's also on eBay. Nice early finding these thumb rings. They can be a little bit tricky, but you gotta just stick your nail in and pull it. Marked for sterling. If you're interested in this one, it is available at the Garnet Cross. Now, typically Dragon's Breath is exactly these colors as we're seeing, which is that like peach pink with the blue breath. Um, there is green Dragon's Breath with blue breath that's very rare. I've got one piece in my collection and I've been searching for years to find more. And every time I think I've found a piece, it escapes me. <laughs> one time a seller canceled the sale. Um, just crazy, crazy stories, which I'll go into when we talk about Dragon's Breath in more detail. Um, but they are special, wonderful pieces. Here is a small, very typical of the Art Deco period Dragon's Breath brooch, kind of like the one that we were looking at earlier today. This one's $99 on Ruby Lane and, oh, and it's sold. So I'm going to stop sharing this. Actually, let's look here. So again, peacock glass, not Dragon's Breath, um, but beautiful. Couldn't help but click on it. <laughs> Allow me to return to our Dragon's Breath. I'm going to click on this link next. Two brooches for the price of one, or really the price of two, just listed as one listing. <laughs> I'm going to click in to Etsy. And so um, we can see, I'm going to play her video and hopefully it shows the breath. Typically, these lighter peacher ones are known to be a little bit earlier. So very turn of the century, um, whereas these just a little bit later. Beautiful brooches, both side by side. Again, you can see that almost electric breath in them. If you're interested, this seller's name is Light of a Silvery Moon. Here's another interesting early one. I do love it when they're in kind of a special detailed setting like this. It always makes me smile. I've got some that it's like, like just pure cab um, and others that are in more intricate settings. You can see that early catch. Again, that mechanically made hinge stamped with sterling from the behind. It often looks like it's this peachy glass color and you don't see any kind of foiling or anything. It is just with the magic of the light where you're going to see the blue breath. Well, 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 I think I may have finally come across some more green ones. So I will be buying these if they're not already sold. <laughs> and I think on that, we are going to, here, let me let me show them to you first. Oh no, I, I apologize. Let me share the right tab. Here we go. So I just came across this little listing, which is on Ruby Lane. And exactly as I was describing to you, this is kind of what I look for. Um, it's a fantastic green one. Just one picture, there we go. Some other pictures too. And so this is exactly the type of thing that I like to buy um, because I've got a brooch that matches and it's been a search for me to find a green one. And I will report back to everyone if I manage to score this. Who is the seller? Green Mannequin.
it looks like a couple of fur clips and they are indeed brass. There we go. How lovely. I will add to cart and deal with it later. <laughs> All right, everyone. I think that it is time to call it a day. Thank you so much for spending this morning with me. It's been a pleasure. If there's ever anything that you need, don't hesitate to reach out, sundaybobbles at gmail.com, and I will put up the next listing event very soon, and I look forward to spending more time with you all. Have a wonderful day, and take care. Bye, everyone. <laughs>